All right, you should know where we are by now. Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18. I'm excited about some series that we have coming up. Uh, Sunday mornings here, we'll, there'll be a few more uh, Sundays, and then we'll start a series in the book of John. And all these scriptures just keep coming up in my own life and all, and, and uh, so I'm looking forward to that. The series is called Believe, and that's what John is all, the book of John is all about. That's why when someone gets saved or we're trying to witness to someone, we'll often give them a copy of the book of John and just say, read this one. And so uh, that's a good uh, passage of scripture. I mean, a good uh, a book of the Bible to read. I had said something about a Wednesday night series that after we're done with this, which is still going to be a while, but, and I just recently felt like the Lord would have me to change that. And uh, so right after Proverbs is Ecclesiastes. We're going to go right into Ecclesiastes, verse by, uh, chapter by chapter, Lord willing, after uh, that we're done with uh, Proverbs. So, but tonight, we're in Proverbs 18, and uh, again, this is one of those Proverbs that seem like every verse is completely unrelated to the other, and so it, it makes it a little difficult to preach a neat little message, but we're going to see what the Lord has for us. I feel like He's given me uh, some verses to labor on here. I'm going to read the whole chapter. Let me see here. Yeah, I'm going to read the whole chapter real quick, and then we'll, uh, we'll get started. Through desire, a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. When the wicked cometh, then cometh also contempt, and with ignominy, ignominy reproach. The words of a man's mouth are as deep waters, and the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. It is not good to accept the person of the wicked to overthrow the righteous in judgment. A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calleth for strokes. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. He also that is slothful in his work is brother to them that is a great waster. There's a lot of verses in, in this pa, uh, chapter that are very familiar. And so uh, it's always good to read them all. Uh, but we won't be dealing with most of them. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. The rich man's wealth is his strong city and as an high wall in his own conceit. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, and before honor is humility. He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear? The heart of the prudent getteth knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeketh knowledge. A man's gift maketh room for him, and bringeth him before great men. He that is first in his own cause seemeth just, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. The law causeth contentions to cease and parteth between the mighty. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled." Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing. All the wives in here say amen. And, ordain, and let's see, obtaineth favor of the Lord. Amen. The poor useth entreaties, but the rich answereth roughly. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So, you might be able to tell what I mean by so many good verses in there. What do I preach? And uh, so never would have expected it would be this, but the Lord showed me a few verses here that popped out, and they have to do with strong cities, tall walls, 
strong towers and, uh, and such, and they, and they pop out in this verse at me. So we're going to talk about that. The title of the message is, Why God's Tower is the Safest Place. And so, uh, real quickly, what is the principle here of having strong cities, tall walls, and strong towers? That goes back way, you know, back as far as history is recorded. We see uh, this being the thing to do, if you can. If you have the resources to be able to do it, build yourself a big wall. That sound familiar? <laughs> Last presidential election, it was all this talk about uh, these walls. And, and uh, from what I understand, there's been some prototypes built and some money designated to the walls, but it hasn't been hardly any money at all. <laughs> but, uh, but you can see where this thought of, well, we'll have security if we build these big walls. Okay, And so cities... As far, as, as far back as you can go, built walls around their city, strong walls. And, uh, and they, would build a, they would have towers on them so people could stand up on top of the towers and see what's coming. And, and uh, sometimes they would have that, that battlement design where there's, uh, you know, uh, you've seen the top of castles and walls where it does something like that. And you could shoot your arrows or whatever and then, and then hide behind a shield. And, uh, and so this is a thing that we see. Strong walls, strong cities, strong towers. And so uh, uh, the idea is simple. Keep your enemy outside of the city walls and have, great, uh, have the greatest advantage, the upper hand, the, the uh, higher ground in your battle, and that will, uh, that will help. Now, you remember throughout history until, you know, fairly recent history, they fought with usually close range, you know, hand-to-hand they had uh, swords or like uh, maces or, or whatever. And then you had the arrows. And then somebody came up with a great idea. You can dip, you can dip that into some kind of flammable substance and light it on fire, and, and that'll do a lot of damage. They got catapults that would, that would shoot that. So you understand in that, that terminology why it was so important to have big walls and strong, uh, strong towers. Um, you wanted it to be... F- strong and fireproof and you wanted it to protect you and your family and all that okay so uh so real quickly as by way of introduction let me think of let's talk about a wall the first wall i mean the tower first tower in the bible first let me give you the the scriptures here of uh, in proverbs 18 look at these verses if you would proverbs 18 verse 10 says this the name of the lord is a strong tower the righteous runneth into it and is safe. Look at the book of uh, Genesis 11. Genesis chapter 11, we read of a uh, great tower, the Tower of Babel. It says that the, uh, the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name. Now, we just read that the name of the Lord is a strong tower but they're, they're concerned about their name. Let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down, and we know uh, the rest of the story. And I'm not quite sure what, the, what, what all their motivation was. I tend to think a generation raised up, and they heard the story from their parents and from their grandparents about this global flood that destroyed everything. And, of course, everybody was living hundreds of years and having lots of babies. And so the, the world began to uh, multiply in just a couple generations. And I almost sensed that they felt like, yeah, what if God wants to destroy us again for our wickedness? So I got an idea. Instead of a boat, we'll just build this really strong tower that can't be, uh, uh, that can't be destroyed. And, I, and they said, let's make a name for ourselves. And I almost feel like they were challenging God, like going up against God and try to destroy the earth again, if you would, you know, and, let, and let's see if you can. And so, of course, you don't want to challenge God. That's a bad idea. But uh, they had this idea 
of building this tower, and there's a whole lot that can be said about that. That's not the, the point of this message. But uh, they, they, they wanted to build this tower to build a name for themselves. And, uh, and, and we read that in comparison to Proverbs 18. It says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Well, think about this. Many people um, have the same idea. They build, we, I, we t- might tend to do the same thing. They'll build a tower, if you will, like a tower, like, like they built the Tower of Babel. We'll build these, I'm trying to speak metaphorically here. We'll build so, uh, ourselves towers, a place to run for security. You know, where we can, uh, what do we think is the right answer? What do we think is the, is the safest place in this for our own good? And uh, uh, the, the Bible says in, uh, uh, let's look, look at, if you're in Proverbs 18, let's back at our text. The Bible says uh, in verse 11, almost seems like they're connected here. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. But look at verse 11. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. And as a high wall in his own conceit. You know, you got two, two ideas here. One runs to the Lord for his safety. And one says, you know, I'm not going to feel secure unless I got myself a big bank account, you know, a uh, savings account. I've got a, uh, 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 you know, enough to take care of me. And I'm not saying it's not why it's, it, it's a wise thing to, uh, to have emergency funds and to have a, 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 a savings account and all that. I understand. But, a, but the, what the Bible's saying is that a, a, a rich man, his wealth is his strong tower, his strong city. That's where he gets his security. And the Bible says that we should get our security from, uh, from the Lord. Look at verse 18 and 19. I put these two together. I think they're kind of related. The lot causeth contentions to cease and parteth between the mighty. Now, I've never understood the concept of the lot, really. Like, it almost seems superstitious. And I don't know, there was probably several different methods or, or ways that they casted lots, but we always think about drawing straws. Has anyone ever done, done that? Like, okay, we're going to decide who, you know, who does dishes today. So here, here everybody draws a straw. Whoever gets the shortest straw, you got to do dishes, right? That's, that's kind of like casting lots. And so, you know, whether or not, it's, in the Bible, we see sometimes they casted lots, and that was the Lord giving them an answer. Uh, probably if we tried to figure out whose turn it was to do dishes, we probably wouldn't say, ah, God wants you to do dishes tonight. We probably just got the, you know. But uh, casting lots and everybody agreeing, okay, this is what we're going to do. Whoever draws shortest, shortest stick, they're it. There's no contention. You all agreed. It happened. And, 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 and so, so we're good. So, uh, so the, the, where was that? The, verse 18, the lot cast causeth contentions to cease and parteth between the mighty. Look at 19. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And their contentions are like the bars of a castle. The same terminology, castle, strong, big walls, strong cities, and all that kind of stuff. So some people might turn to their... Uh, their contentions and their strife, and uh, and and for some reason, that's their security. <laughs> you know, is is uh, finding contention with people and and being offended whenever somebody says something. And I don't, I don't understand. Like like they feel like they have to take a stand, and 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 uh, maybe that's their security. I don't completely uh, uh, know what's so secure about that. But so here's the thing uh, that, that I want to say. That was all just kind of an introductory, uh, re- some introductory mo- remarks. The message I want to give is this. We have, as Christians have no doubt. The Lord's tower is the strongest tower. The Lord's tower is the best tower. That's where, we're gonna, that's where we need to go for our security and for our strength. And we need to go uh, to the Lord. But lest we forget, here are some of the wonderful benefits of being in God's tower, okay? First of all is this. In, from God's tower, we have perfect view of the enemy and the battlefield, okay? Now look at Judges 9. This is a fun story here. Judges 9. It's not quite as fun as the guy getting the tent uh, spike through his head, but this is a close second here. Judges chapter 9.
All right. Let's look at verse, let's start with around 50. Um, okay, so we're talking about Abimelech here. And uh, if we back up, actually, look at 46. There's two, two towers in, in this text here. And when all the men of the tower of Shechem heard that, they entered into a hold of the house of the god of Berith. And it was told Abimelech and all his men of the tower of, uh, of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. And Abimelech got him up to the Mount Zalman, he and all his people that were with him. And uh, Abimelech took an axe in his hand and cut down a bough from the tree and took it and laid it on his shoulders and said unto the people that were with him, What ye have uh, seen me do, make haste and do as I have done. And all the people likewise cut down every man his bough and followed Abimelech and put them to the hold. Apparently that means somehow they were able to put it under the tower. Okay, they were able to get in there and put it under the, the tower. And they set the hold on fire uh, about them, upon them so that all the men of the tower of Shechem died also, about a thousand men and women. So he defeated people at this tower and he thought, now I know what to do. I'm a, now I know how to defeat people in the strong tower. And here's, as we read on, here's what we find. Uh, verse 50, then, when Abimelech, uh, then went Abimelech to Thebes and encamped against Thebes and took it. But there was a strong tower within the city. And whither fled all the men and the women and all they of the city that shut it to them and got them up to the top of the tower. And Abimelech came unto the tower and fought against it and went hard unto the door of the tower to burn it with fire. So he thought, well, I can just do it again, what I did before. And a certain woman cast a piece of millstone upon Abimelech's head and all to break his skull. And he didn't like that. <laughs> he had somebody else kill him because he didn't want a woman in battle to be the one that killed him. But but he, but he was thinking, okay, I've got good ground here. I don't see anybody. I'm going to do what I did before. I'm going to get into the uh, 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 the hold there, and I'm setting this tower on fire. But the lady on top had the good, the best advantage. She could see, and I don't know how big the piece of millstone was, but she just dropped it right on his head and broke his skull. <laughs> Because she had the, the advantage. And, that, and that's why they build the tall towers. That's why they put them in strategic places where they can see everything that's coming to them. Well, the first point I want to make about, the, about God's strong tower is that we have the perfect view of the enemy and the battlefield. When we come to the Lord and we put our trust in Him and we're in Christ, like the Bible says, uh, we have the perfect view. Uh, what we think can be deceiving. Uh, Proverbs 16, 25 says this, There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. But we're, when we're in the Lord, and we're seeking His will, and, know, and wanting to know what He wants for us, and we're, we're seeking our safety in Him, uh, then we can see everything about it. Uh, when we stay in the castle of God's Word and look out from His high, strong tower, we, be, we begin to see clearer picture of what is going on around us. We begin to see, like our text says, those who have false hope in their riches. And whereas most of the world says, oh, I wish I had riches like that. Oh, I wish I had this. I had... We, when you're in Christ and you're in his strong tower, you begin to see that's not a really strong foundation to put your trust in. Riches, you know, they're going to fail. They're going to fail you. Not to mention, you're, you're, you're going to have struggles for the rest of your life with friendships if you got lots of money. <laughs> and uh, we begin to see all these things that, uh, that that's not right. Somebody who finds uh, folly, uh, uh, they find it right to uh, uh, engage in fightings and being offended at everything. We know as Christians, great peace have they which love the law and nothing shall offend them. What a blessing. We don't have to go around being offended every time somebody says something. We love the, well, what does the Bible say? How much peace? I mean, you get so much peace uh, from just saying, well, we've got the answer right here. Let's go to the answer and find out the truth, okay? I'll just throw a few more in here. We get to see that alcohol isn't like all the commercials like to show you. <laughs> On the commercials, everyone's having a good time partying and 
And uh, they got the pretty girl sitting next to them, and they open up a can of beer, and they drink it, and life is great. As Christians, we get to see a clear perspective that you, that's a lie. That's not what we see. I remember taking uh, my daughter door knocking around, around the town, and, and, and this guy was drunk. And uh, we knocked on his door, and he invited me in, and he, his house was an absolute filthy mess. And it smelled bad, and he didn't have a shirt on, and he was stumbling around, and he had his music blaring, didn't even think to turn it down because we were in there, and he's slurring his words, and he's talking to us. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm glad my daughter gets to see this, you know? Everybody says, oh, well, your kids are so sheltered, and they're kept from the world, and they don't get to see the world. They do, it's just they get to see the right side of the world. <laughs> they get to see it and say, why would you want to live like that? Why would you want to live in that kind of a family? Why would you want to live addicted to those substances and controlled by, by those things? They get to see the proper view. Why? Because we're in Christ. He's our strong tower. We don't have to run to alcohol to solve our problems. We've got this, we've, we know uh, where the answer is. How about Hollywood shows you all kinds of fornication and adultery and, and it seems to be satisfying and just sleeping around and jumping from this person to that person and, and, uh, and, it, and it portrays it like it's no big deal. But somebody who is in the Lord and reading the Bible and sees that's wicked. And God, there's a, he says, you sin against your own body. And, uh, and of course, uh, adultery and, and all that, we, we see the, uh, how foolish and how much folly that is. We see the effects of uh, people in our society who... Uh, uh, I'm just always, uh, it just kind of blows my mind. I don't know, uh, I've, I've not had to live. And I, what, I think what the problem is, I was just talking to some people about this today, but I think what the problem is we have generations that, that didn't see the truth and didn't see clearly these things, and they're raising a generation, and it just seems to be getting worse and worse. But that's this generation of people who, you know, they, call the, they say that we have the, we're in the entitlement uh, generation, right? We're raising the entitlement generation. Boy, that's true. <laughs> I'm seeing it all around us. People that think, well, I don't have to work. Somebody else is going to take care of me. Uh, I don't have to do anything. And, and, uh, and man, I see that. And I just think it's not that it's, it's not. And, and, and here's what, if, if you don't give to them, then it's like you don't love them. You don't care about them. Well, that's not the truth. We see from the Bible that if you love somebody, you're going to say, you've got to Take care of yourself. You've got to use some wisdom, and you've got to do, uh, do things to help yourself. Anyway, uh, so we see all this stuff when we're in the Lord. We're, in his, we're, we're on top of his strong tower. We begin to see everything clearly. Number two, why is uh, God's strong tower uh, the safest place? We've got unlimited resources. Uh, often... The strategy would be, if you're in this situation, you're trying to overtake the city, your army is surrounding the city, and everybody's up in the tower, or they're, you know, they're, they're taking guard, and, and all. One of the strategies they would do is they would, they would just make sure that their army is fed, they've got all the food and water that they need, and they would just encamp the, the castle or whatever, and they just wait. Eventually, they're going to run out of food, and they're going to run out of water, and then they're trapped. There's nothing they can do. You can only live so long without food and water. And so they would just sit out there with their resources, and we find that ta tactic used in the Bible. They just wait out there, and they just wait it out until those people have no food. They, they, they can't go get food. And, uh, and so they would do that. Well, you don't have to worry. If you're in Christ, you're in his strong tower, we've got unlimited resources uh, at our hands. We don't have to worry about running out. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, our salvation, of course, we don't have to worry about, you know, being saved today and not saved tomorrow. Uh, we don't have to worry about, well, let's look at, uh, I've got a few verses from the book of John. And since we're going to be doing a series out of John, I'm, I'm, I'm just real excited about it as I start reading some of these little nuggets. John chapter 6. If you would, turn over there. John, the book of John, Gospel according to John, chapter 6.
You'll recognize this story. He's, uh, uh, he's, he's talking to them here and says, uh, let me see, where am I? Well, hold your place. We're going to come back to that. But first turn to John uh, 4.14. John 4.14 is the woman at the well. And Jesus says this, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Talking about the water that she was giving him. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But look at this. This is the best part. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. It's not like, you know, it's going to spring up and then maybe it'll spring up again later and it's going to spring up. It'll spring up into eternal life. You know, I always like to tell people when, I, when I'm giving them the gospel, the Bible says to somebody who gets saved, it says you have eternal life. It's not you're working towards getting eternal life. When he saves you, you have eternal life. And, uh, and, and we are a child of the king and we have all of his resources at our fingertips. John 6. John chapter 6, 32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And then he goes on right there. So you see this uh, over and over. Jesus said of himself, you follow me, you trust in me, you call on me to be your savior and you're going to have, uh, you're never going to be hungry. You're never going to thirst again. Uh, what a blessing. <clears throat> the word of God is, uh, is quick and powerful. You know what that word quick means? That means it's alive. Um, I think everybody in here can relate to this. The Bible's only so long. You know, I, I know that none of us feel like we've read it enough times. But have you ever noticed every time you read it over again, it's just like it's, it's, all, it's new all over again. <laughs> it's just like you're learning new things. I never saw it that way. I never, it's always exciting. It doesn't get boring. If you watch a movie or read a book, you can only read it a few times and you're like, all right, I already know what's going to happen. It's not exciting anymore. The Word of God is quick and it's powerful and it's sharp. And it's, a, and, and it's an unlimited resource that God has given us at our disposal. Third thing about this, uh, about this tower, why God's tower is the safest uh, and the best place, is it's indestructible. Eventually, I mean, you think of the, the, the mightiest fortresses that have ever existed that we know of in history. Where are they now? <laughs> you know, they're, they're just, they're in shambles, you know, where they, they've decayed or somebody's taken them over, somebody's burned it down, someone's destroyed it. You, you, can't, you can put your trust in something and think, you know, what was it they said when they were in the Titanic? They, they said, God himself couldn't sink this ship. Oh, yeah, really? <laughs> and he did sink it, okay? But we put our trust in things and we think, this is surely the best. This is surely the safest place I can be. And God says, no, if you're not following me, uh, that's not the safest place. Everything is destructible uh, except God's strong tower is indestructible. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Um, uh, that verse right there is very special to me because when, uh, when Richard Abbey called me to come visit him in the hospital, I was on my way up there thinking, okay, I want to make sure, first of all, that he's saved. And I want to give him the gospel, and I want to ask him, does he know for sure? And, uh, and is there evidence there of the Holy Spirit inside of him? You know, I'm trying to think, of, think through all these things. And when I got there and began to talk to him, uh, he said, uh, especially since the phone call that I got was from the nurse that was like, he really needs spiritual guidance and he needs all this. So I thought, man, maybe he's not saved. And I went to him, and I was thinking of that verse. You know, God, the Lord said, during this troubling time, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I was just thinking about that. And when I went in there, one of the first things I said, well, you feel like the Lord is, is with you during this time? And as, as soon as I said, do you feel like the Lord? He said, I know the Lord will never leave me nor forsake me. He just quoted that. And I, and I just felt like the Spirit was, was telling me, you know, he's saved. He's got the Spirit within him, you know. And, uh, and so I 
confirmed a little bit more, talked about when, they, when both of them got saved, and they've both been saved and baptized they, uh, according to their testimony. And, and uh, he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake me, sake thee. And I thought, how powerful that is. Jesus, before he's, he's going uh, up into heaven, says, I'm going to send you the comforter. And he says, lo, I'm with you always, even until the end of the world. And he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake thee. And, I'm, and what a blessing. We don't ever have to worry about that being taken away from us. John 10, uh, 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 if you're still in John, just go ahead and go over there to John 10. Twenty-seven, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hands. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hands. I and my Father are one. You guys heard the illustration I know many times, but you can't help but see it. We're in the Lord in the, uh, Jesus' hands, and he says... He's in the, the Father's hands. <laughs> Nobody can get, get us out of Jesus' hands, but then he says, to top that off, then you're in the Father's hands, you know. And to top that off, the, the Bible says that you're sealed by the Holy Spirit to the day of redemption. So you are uh, thrice sealed by God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're all protecting you, and they're all keeping you. You're sealed People get so scared about losing their salvation. And I understand that. Mostly it's just from the, the heresy that's preached out in the world. But there's even some verses in the Bible that might scare you. And you read that. And hey, if it scares you, do this. Live for the Lord. <laughs> try not to sin. Try to live a clean life. Try to do the work that he's called you to do. Then you'll feel saved. <laughs> but that's not what salvation is. Salvation is realizing in your mind that, that I have trusted in the Lord. He has saved me, and I'm sealed to the day of redemption. Why? Because of my good works? No, absolutely not. Because of what he did on Calvary and what, what he, the gift that he made available to us uh, by his death on the cross and the resurrection. And so, uh, what a wonderful truth. What security. The strong tower. You want something that's secure, right? Well, if you're in Christ, if he's your Lord and you're in his uh, strong tower, uh, then you have nothing to fear. The verse said uh, in our text, it said that uh, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Well, Jesus, uh, the Bible says this, that uh, there's no other name given among uh, men whereby we must be saved. And so uh, Jesus Christ is the name. He is the strong tower. He is uh, who we need to trust in to be part of that strong tower. So don't forget, uh, don't, don't, we don't need to have a name for ourselves. We don't need to run off and try to find our own place for security and our own way of fighting our problems. We need to trust the Lord. Uh, we need to trust in the strong tower, uh, the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we, we love you. Thank you for this.